Yeah, I'm, the mic's muted, so. You want to try and unmute yourself, Connie? <laughs> Can you hear? Yeah. You got it. So you. OK, all right, good, good. OK, I'm going to hit star six and be quiet here. Well, shall we get started? All right, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the June COG meeting and have some uh, housekeeping rules about uh, keeping your mic on mute unless you're speaking um, and use raise your hand in the uh, chat function if you want to speak. And the cameras are optional and this meeting will be recorded. And we have uh, the agenda. We'll start off with the roll call. We'll have subcommittee reports. Uh, Connie Boris will present the uh, voting process. There'll be a executive uh, order update. And then we'll have some time for the uh, focus group and the public notification discussion. And then finally ending with a round table. So I uh, want to start with the uh, well, so subcommittees are engaging the public website review preventive maintenance measures and the membership subcommittee. Do we want to start the roll call? Well, yes, I completely forgot about that. OK. Brad? Uh, yep, I'm present. Harley. Present. Tina? Honey, we all know if she's here. Dan Brown? Dan Brown is here. Daniel Burlingame? Dave Norwood? Did win? Yep. Elizabeth? Gail? Uh, Gail Dugan. Jeffrey Dutton. Jeremy Welsh. Joe? Yes, I'm here. Justin, Ken Harvey, Laura Ogar, Leah, Lynn McIntosh, Margaret Brum. Mary Blanchard here. Matthew. Pam McQueer. Eddie Baldwin. Rick Burns, I see you. Yep. Rick Radisky. Uh, Pataki, Sandy, Shalene, Stacy Taylor, Teresa. Tony. Tyler? Yep. Bill Burnett? Yes. Bill Creel? Yes. She made some on him.
OK, so now we're on to uh, subcommittee reports and engaging the public. That's uh, our subcommittee and uh, we had uh, a meeting and there's a couple of uh, projects that we're going to be undertaking. First, the uh, there's something called the uh, local officials briefing and that's anytime a new site goes live, there's a uh, a briefing between MPART and local officials. And rather than doing uh, case studies, we thought it might be better to uh, sit in on that uh, meeting and that will provide a lot of uh, background site information as far as uh, um, you know when the site was discovered. It, it just, uh, it's just a briefing for uh, the benefit of, of local officials. So uh, Rather than having uh, some of the case studies being prepared, we thought that would be a good idea to uh, attend that. The first one is on the 22nd. It's regarding the uh, South Lyon Township wastewater. And that's, uh, they're done before the uh, sites go live on the MPART website. So we're gonna be uh, attending those. There's also a uh, MDHHS and local health department uh, monthly meeting. I'm not sure if we can get on the agenda um, this month, but we're going to try and get on the, the agenda uh, maybe next month and uh, sit in on that. It's a good opportunity to hear um, what the health departments and the local health, uh, what the MDHHS and local health departments are discussing. And our, our goal is to see if there's can be some uh, health assistance to uh, provide public notification um, when we sit in, a, in on that meeting. So. Those are the kinds of things that we're working on, and uh, we're probably going to be working with uh, the uh, with, with MPART on some more language related to public notification. We prepared the uh, matrix last time, and we have some uh, uh, potential revisions on that, but we want to get involved with the actual wording, the, the nitty gritty as far as public notification, so we'll be involved with that uh, in meetings to come. So that's our summary. And then the website review committee. Oh uh, yeah, thanks Rick. This is Bill Creel. Um, we met uh, this afternoon and um, Kelly informed us that the people that come to the website are about 50% new people and 50% returning users of the website. Um, and uh, we were taking a look at what should be on the home page. So we had a couple of recommendations come out of that. One was, um, under investigations, um, change that title to investigations and sites because a lot of people come on looking for sites or and or consider putting um, the site GIS on the front page of the web page. Um, that would help people get to sites a little easier. And also on the uh, drinking water title, we suggested that there's a lot of people that are looking for information on wells. So the possibility would be to add, change that title, drinking water and wells. But uh, we're not sure exactly how much space you have on that title bar. But anyhow, we had a couple of suggestions and I think that's gonna be our continued focus on this new web page is to look for suggestions on uh, help people get to places easier. And that's about it for today. Thank you. All right, Preventative Measures Subcommittee. Thanks, Rick. This is Dave Wynn. Um, on the 23rd of May, I met with uh, Abby and Bill Barnett, and we kind of talked about, um, you know, we kind of explained to Abby what was, you know, what the, the intent was of having this, what we're calling community awareness information uh, put on this on the web on the uh, web link under public engagement. Um, Abby had indicated that we needed to put together a draft, um, and then I met with the group on June the first, and we sat down. We put together a draft. We we have a, currently a a draft that that we believe is a good start at this point. Uh, Abby and Kelly, I plan on sending a copy to you uh, probably Monday or Tuesday. Uh, so you guys can start to begin to review and, and make comments accordingly. Uh, just so that everyone's aware, 
a lot of the information that, and Abby, you and I talked about this when we met on the 23rd, is um, a lot of the information is uh, for this um, web, this web information is stuff that we pulled right off of the current website under the PFOS 101. Um, there's a lot of information there. So we kind of subheaded that and then added additional tabs uh, or links underneath that. So um, Abby, as we talked, I mean, I know this has got to go to the AG's office, but again, there's a lot of information that's currently on the website that we utilized as well as uh, stuff that was used from MDHHS. Uh, so it uh, currently it's right now, it's about three pages long. Uh, and like I said, Monday or Tuesday, I will forward you a copy and then we can begin to have further conversation from there. Perfect. All right. I look forward to it, Dave. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, membership subcommittee. Actually, the membership subcommittee did not meet. Okay. All right. Um, are there any uh, questions for the subcommittees uh, before we move on to the uh, voting process? So uh, <clears throat> just one quick note on the engaging the public. Hey, Rick. Rick, I have, this is Connie. I have one quick question for Bill sure. Creel. When is, when are the sites, the MPART sites going to be updated? When I look at the sites for Wayne County, I see 2019. It, it's very frustrating not to see the up, an update of the sites, but to look at old data. So I think that's something that uh, I'm not sure Bill Creel, but if, if MPART could kind of update it is what I'm saying. All right, thanks. Well, Connie, this is Bill, Bill again, and we did talk about that during our meeting. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit about the uh, Eagle um, site. Number of sites have grown and the, the site coordinators are 80 some now. And, you know, the, the priority for updating the sites and how we can have some feedback onto that. And, um, you know, Rick, Rick let us know that he finds it real easy to talk to the site invest the site coordinators and get uh, information easily from them. But I think that one of the things that we're going to noodle around a little bit is how would we help Eagle prioritize which sites need to be updated? You know, if if we we're we're seeing locals want or use the information or need it and then I think maybe we ought to figure out a process to get that Kelly and Abby is some feedback on which sites would be a priority to keep up to date. One of the things that we also talked about <clears throat> with that actually specific question, Connie, um, and I actually used you as an example, <laughs> is um, you know, we look at Google Analytics also as a tool. Uh, it tells us, you know, how many people are hitting each site investigation page, and that's kind of driving the priority to what pages we're updating. Um, you know, yes, mm -hmm. the ones that you're talking about, I'm aware that they're way out of date, um, and we'll continue on working that working on getting those updated, but the priority is to the pages that people are hitting. Mm. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Do you have something, Dan? I yeah, were, were you all done, Connie? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my thing was just real quick. Um, can the discussion around the South Lion wastewater treatment plant? Can you loop me into that one specifically? Yeah, I, I can send you the link to the uh, um, to the local official briefing. So um, I will do that. Perfect. <clears throat> I did talk to Rick about that 
Um, I'm going to forward him all of those meeting notices. It's a lot easier for me to remember one person versus whoever else might want to be invited. So he's going to help me navigate those further to whoever would like to join those conference calls with local officials. And, and I, I, I'm going to try to meet 100 percent of the time, but I'm going to be honest, I'm a human and sometimes forget accidentally. OK, and, um, you know, if I know uh, I'll look at the uh, announcements and whichever uh, county they're in, I'll try and uh, forward them also to the uh, particular uh, representatives on the COG. And I guess uh, since you're in the uh, Huron River watershed, that's a little more complicated, but uh, we'll, we'll figure out a way to notify you, Dan, for, for um, sites in your watershed area. So. Yeah, just to make it easier on you, if if, if anything comes up in um, really any of the the southeast Michigan counties, you know, Wayne okay. Monroe, Oakland, then I I can also touch base with uh, Rouge River, you know, the Downriver watersheds, Clinton River, you know, okay. whoever makes sense. We're we're talking all those folks pretty pretty regularly, okay. so I will have you as a southeast Michigan point person. So, all okay. right. Uh, we have another question, hand raised. It says John. Or uh, uh, hi, I'm uh, interested in learning about that uh, South Lion too. Okay. Uh, you can share that information. I'll appreciate it. And your your last name? It's uh, John. Joe Kang. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right. Um, excuse me, Rick, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. OK, this is Lynn Posh. I, I just joined in from a park bench here in Seattle. <laughs> um, I just wanted to let you know I'm present at the meeting. I wasn't here for the roll call. OK. But I just wanted to make sure that I knew how to get into the meeting and out of it. So I'll just un I'll mute myself again. Thank you. All right. So uh, I guess we're on to the uh, voting. It's a very striking visual, uh, Con or <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> but uh, Connie, do you want to uh, present that? Do you need to have the uh, your memo? displayed or star six Connie hey can you okay Rick I'm ready to roll on the proposed impart cog voting procedures the floor um, is yours Okay, this was this committee uh, had several different people um, on it. Uh, Mary Blanchard, Charlie, Bill Barnett, uh, Gail was on, Lynn McIntosh was on, and it, it, uh, it there were a lot of emails flying back and forth on the proposed uh, draft that we had. This is the final draft. So this is for the COG members to look at. We really worked hard on this uh, team effort all the way. Uh, it's based on uh, what other non, I know we're not a nonprofit. We are a citizens advisory work group, but nonprofit organizations, they have to make decisions uh, to fulfill their mission. So what they generally do is they re, uh, rely on Robert's rules of order to conduct board meetings or their annual meetings, whatever. For us, we don't have any written bylaws. We could do it, but we would be spending a lot of time doing that instead of fulfilling our mission. So what we need to do, we had to come up with a voting procedure. And one of the things that we ran into is that we don't have a regular quorum. We have people, two people from each county all over the state, maybe a third to a half of them will attend. Well, what's your quorum? 
usually in a nonprofit, it'll be one half of the board members. There might be 15 of them plus one. So eight people on that would be a quorum. Well, we're not going to have that. Our quorum goes up and down all the time, so we can't rely on that. So we had to come up with another more flexible way. We don't have in-person meetings. We have virtual meetings. That makes it, you know, tougher to set a quorum. So what we decided uh, to do is that who, what, whoever is present at a meeting, that will be the quorum for the COG members. That's why the quorum will change from meeting to meeting. That's the best we can come up with. Uh, also, we talked a little bit about, okay, suppose that you have a motion coming up and somebody feels very strongly about it, but guess what? They're up north, they don't have any Wi-Fi, and they're in trouble, but they want their vote to count. If that's the case, we will have proxy voting. And all that means is that the COG member that's up north and can't get anybody to can cannot attend the meeting will give uh, a person the proxy one other cog member member who will be attending the meeting they will be there they will have the person up north will have to notify somebody on the leadership team sandy rick or mary and say hey i have given my vote to xyz and that person will vote for me and they will say that I'm there by proxy at the roll call, and then they will give my vote when a motion comes up for the motion I'm really, really concerned about. Okay, so the proposed voting procedure, though, is is very simple. It's uh, very much like like what you do in Robert's Rules. You raise your hand if you're interested in making a motion. You're recognized by the chair, and you say what your motion is. You always need to have a second on a motion. So another COG member will say, hey, I second that motion. Uh, but if nobody seconds it, your motion dies. So if assuming that the motion is seconded, then the chair will restate the motion to everybody at the meeting. And then you go into discussion. Everybody discuss, discusses the pros and cons of that particular motion. And then after the discussion is over, the chair will say, okay, let's take a roll call vote on this motion for all the members that are present on the meeting. And then we came up with the idea, okay, so if everybody votes, uh, they're gonna have eight, you're gonna have yeses and nos, and you may have people that will abstain. A person that abstains, their vote is not counted. If it's a relatively simple motion, then whatever the quorum is, like, uh, for example, Kelly, how many people are present? How many COG members are present at today's meeting? Um, now looking through the list, I believe there are 14. There were 12 at roll call. Lynn okay. and Elizabeth have since joined. Okay. so. If we, if somebody raises the motion, for example, suppose as a COG member, I say to the COG group, well, we have discussed this draft voting procedure for COG members, and suppose somebody else seconds that, then we would need to get a vote of eight people to vote yes on the proposal if it was to pass. Okay? Uh, so, why do we also, that's called a simple majority vote. Uh, a two thirds vote is uh, usually for something that's far more serious. I mean, like really serious, um, you know, like uh, the COG has met its mission after five years and we're ready to disband because we have met our mission. That would be something really, really important. And there, there you may want to have a two thirds uh, majority vote. And, but in, in this case where we're looking, we have a leadership team, we have established that. Now, in order for us to go forward, we need to make decisions and we need to have a majority vote so we can 
we can start moving forward. I think we've done an awful lot in, in the past year, but we got to keep moving. And one way we keep moving is by having motions and implementing those motions after they're passed. So uh, that, that pretty much sums it up. I will let the other uh, committee members uh, feel free to say whatever you'd like to say. Uh, this is the gist of the meeting for, for this COG voting procedure. Okay, Mary, do you have anything? Lynn, Gail, Bill, Charlie? Hi, Connie. Uh, this is Mary. I just wanted to commend you for starting us off with this and for coming up with the original draft for the voting procedures. Thanks. No, no problem. Welcome. Is there any uh, discussion from the uh, COG? Sounds good to me. We support. All right. I don't see any other any hands raised. So um, I guess uh, what, we, what we should do then is uh, everybody should read this over and we'll have a vote next week or next month. <laughs> so uh, yeah. uh, and then if uh, people are uh, cannot attend, they should proxy their vote if they wanted to have a vote counted. But um, we will uh, actually have a uh, a vote on this and we'll follow the uh, the rules as outlined. So. Oh. Hey, Rick. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Lynn McIntosh. It took me a minute to <laughs> unmute myself. Um, I think this is a great step forward. I wanted to mention we did discuss that we would hope for most occasions there wouldn't be a need to abstain from a vote. And Another thing to think about is prior to what might be a, an important or pivotal vote, such as whether to to accept these voting procedures, that somehow it it is given out ahead of time so people have a chance if it's important to them to vote by proxy. Yeah. But that one Just thing that. I don't know, Connie, I don't know, yeah. Connie, if you mentioned this scenario. But what if something happens like in the meeting, like right then and there, something that's not a topic that, like like this decision to take a vote next meeting or something else that comes up in the moment. Does the system allow, and do, does, do other members think this system should allow for a nimbleness, so to speak, to move ahead on something if it comes up during well, that meeting? Yeah, Lynn, that's why it's very important to be present at the meeting. There's yes, not much I, you can do. I agree, and I think, that. yeah, I, I think that needs to be underscored somehow in another communication to the larger group that because we're diverse and because the membership does ebb and flow, that really if you want to have a say, you, you want your voice to count, the most important thing you can do is to be present at these meetings somehow, some way, um, so that we can move forward. That's all. That's, uh, I was going like to say, that. That's not, that, that sounds like something the membership committee should uh, consider doing, putting out a, you know, a, a memo to that effect. Um, okay. Anyway, Maybe like got... something like, mm -hmm. go ahead. I was going to say we have two uh, hands raised, uh, uh, so I'll turn that over. Charlie, do you want to go first? Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Can you hear me OK? Yep. Um, just a comment on the subject under discussion. What some organizations, how some organizations deal with the challenge that Lynn has raised is um, an agenda is adopted no later than so many days preceding the meeting and the agenda is followed. And uh, that way things. Uh, some things you know, it kind of not cuts down on the likelihood of things popping in on the agenda that uh, if somebody's interested in. They don't know about it in advance and they can't weigh in on it. If they're not at the meeting. Just a thought. 
Charlie, Charlie, I would like to to say, though, that according to Robert's rules of order, which we are not following, and I totally agree we're not, but one of the first things the chair will say at a nonprofit, are there any additions to the agenda so that the agenda is not really ever totally fixed? But that's in Robert's rules, so that maybe we'll want to say okay you can never change the agenda but then are we tying ourselves down a little too much because somebody can't make a meeting oh yeah you know? yeah perhaps perhaps so and and that sometimes people use the terms new business and old business um right but, um, you're right yeah just throwing out one option it's it's a it's a tough nut to crack <laughs> that, that lynn has brought up and um just throwing some things out there that that may or may not have any value. Well, I, I like the idea. I like the idea of putting new business as a. You know, as a agenda item in case people want to bring things up. But, OK, um, Mary, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to bring up that uh, in our emails back and forth and we did consult with uh, Sandy and Rick uh, before this and I think both Sandy and Rick had mentioned um, about a possibility of even voting online um, and I just wanted to get other members thoughts on that. Thank you. Any discussion? You know, in, in general, I'm OK with, you know, basically what would amount to like absentee voting by email. Um, I, I don't have any like theoretical. You know, admonition against that. <laughs> the, the only thing I guess I'm, you know, a little worried about is like if, if you're really trying to be transparent, you know, how do you know that the email or the vote came from that person? Um, specifically and then that just means that you know you have to keep track of like basically verified email addresses or you know can only be from the email address that's on the on the list or so forth um which could get a little, little tricky if somebody challenged it i suppose but you know generally speaking you know voting by proxy or voting by email directly seems okay to me Yeah, uh, I, I think the reason why I brought that up was uh, election of officers. Um, we may want to make that even broader than just at a meeting. Um, but I, I really, you know, the where we'd have to do a uh, an email vote, I, I think would, would have to be something like election of officers or, you know, something very significant. Mm -hmm. uh, Rick, this is Lynn. And I, I agree with that as well. I think depending on something that's significant like that, but in general, I think the simple roll call is ideal because here I am in a arboretum in Seattle, right? And I could vote yeah. today yeah. and I'm participating because it's important to me. And, okay. and I like the nimbleness of, you know, you can, there's a roll call, right? There's no, you're representing yourself or or prox or the proxy and I, I and we trust each other i trust someone to represent me and i i really like the idea of also uh letting a leadership member know as well at least one of you three so yeah. that it's, it's 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 kept track of that's all no i, so I, I and like, I, I i like the yeah go ahead i was gonna say i like that that check about you know letting a leadership uh, committee member know mm -hmm. so it's you know, if there's a proxy yeah. vote where we're going to know about it and yeah. Right. And uh, I think I want to thank Charlie for that. That was his idea. Uh, and also, I do like the idea of keeping track of old business and new business and help. Okay. I think most of us want to be prepared and that's the good thing. So, yeah. All right. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> did, yeah. did you have another comment, Charlie? Your hand's still up. 
Uh, no, I do not. Sorry for. Okay. I don't normally oh. can't normally keep my hand up in the air that long. So sorry <laughs> about that. No, no, no problem. So uh, yeah, so we'll we'll plan on uh, again. Everybody, I want everybody should look at the uh, uh, document that uh, Connie prepared for voting and or the subcommittee prepared for voting, and we will vote on it next uh, next month. So right. can I just uh, ask Connie, did you or did you want me to send this document again and advise people that we're going to vote on it and ask if anybody else has questions or comments before next month? Yeah, Mary, I would appreciate it if you would do it. I really would. OK. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. All right, the next item is the discussion of the uh, governor's executive order for drinking water in the state of Michigan. It's quite a, uh, a large and ambitious program and Andy's going to walk us through that. So. Yeah, I'll just give you a. Just reset on that, just the basics on that for everybody's uh, to get everybody in the same mindset and then give a quick update and, and leave plenty of time for discussion. So. We're talking about Executive Directive 2021-9, um, which Governor Whitmer issued in November of last year. In a general sense, it directed Eagle and DHHS um, to re review the state of Michigan's role in our in our public drinking water systems. So, um, just as a as a important point of refer reference, there is some uh, mention and provisions in the directive that. Uh, apply to private uh, drinking water wells, but the 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 the, the main meat and large uh, primary focus of the directive is on public water supplies, and it also has a strong emphasis on lead contamination. So that was the uh, uh, lead action level exceedances in our state was sort of the lens through which this directive came into being and was issued. Um, <clears throat> that review, um, it directs Eagle and DHS, DHHS to conduct, um, cover six areas. The three most, the three primary areas are um, for Eagle to, to conduct a line by line review of the Saint Safe Drinking Water Act and the uh, accompanying rule, state rules, um, and DHHS to look at. Um, relevant sections of the public health code to safe, safe drinking water for both agencies to um, assess their resources and resource needs to play their roles in in um, Eagle's case, um, implementing the Safe Drinking Water Act and in DHHS's case, um, its education and roles relative to the uh, public health code and then there's an education and an engagement section as well um, which is largely directed um, first and foremost directed in direction of uh, DHHS um, this whole process this internal this this review is to be conducted and completed by 1231 of this year so um, we're in the in the back stretch of the review. Um, um, progress reports are due quarterly. Um, the first progress report was really um, just a matter of uh, the, the departments getting up and running and setting a plan for implementation. The second report is due soon, so um, we'll, we'll try to share that with this group when it is submitted to the governor. Um, the biggest update I think the most important update from very recently is um, Eagle has now um, signed a contract with a consulting firm to lead um, the line by line review of the Safe Drinking Water Act. And in that contract, there are opportunity, there will be opportunities um, for public comment and possibly some uh, public meetings people can attend. Um, so that may be an opportunity for all of you to um, engage in the process. 
Um, we're also getting close to, uh, as I understand it, signing a contract uh, for consultant help on the second portion, the resource review, which as directed by the, the ED, is really going to look at our staff in our drinking water and environmental health division and how it compares to other states in terms of um, the people power technology and resources we're bringing to our uh, regulatory role over public uh, water supplies relative to our peers in other states. So, you know, what does our profile look like in terms of, you know, what's a caseload for a staff person to conduct inspections of public water supply? And how does our enforcement and permitting staff compare on a sort of per supply basis to other states? Um, so those are the those are the two big updates in terms of, you know, in terms of PFAS, I think there's a couple places to, you know, you could plug in on this. Again, the, it's, the, the directive is focused on lead, but the um, line by line review of the Safe Drinking Water Act covers the whole thing, including the MCLs. It could lead to us uh, opening up a rulemaking discussion um, that would allow for further public input um, so that's an opportunity. And that, like I said, in the DHHS sections of the directive, there is some um, points at which um, sort of broader education and engagement of private well owners is mentioned. So um, we will we'll make sure that we get all of you the information on all the public engagement opportunities. Um, that are going to occur uh, between now and the end of the year through that contract we just signed. Do we have any uh, questions? Dave? Yeah, Andy, I have one question. Um, you said the the quarterly updates, the, 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 the as we go forward, the quarterly updates will be expected on progress. Uh, is it is those quarterly updates available to the public on the uh, either in any state of Michigan website that we can as the public can see, or is these strictly internal within uh, state of Michigan? I do not know the answer to that, but I can find we can find out. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'd be, you know, assuming there's nothing. That prohibits us from doing it for some reason that I'm not privy to. You know, we could certainly share them with this group. Thank you. Um, is uh, Andy? Can you hear me? This is Lynn yep. McIntosh. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So when I when I hear this and without seeing all the details here, it does seem to me that we really ought to make whatever use we can if it's through the DHHS and in cooperation with you to get to find a way to get these private drinking wells tested it, it's great to have an executive order focused on the lead if something comes along beside that that just happens to be utterly also important um i think we need more than public education we, we really I, I say this to the whole cog it's something i would make a, a motion to discuss at the next meeting or even as an agenda item, how do we, as soon as possible, get the water tested in all private wells in Michigan? It, it seems it's it's right there. There's not there's no uh, argument on my part, except for resources and money, to to wait on that. So, ca can something like an executive order, at least I, as a citizen, would say, can that be amended, and or can this be extended? That it's this important that we've got to keep going and we've got to take care of these people in Michigan. I feel a great responsibility for the 25% of people I know who live in Michigan. I don't know them. <laughs> I know a lot of people, but that I'm aware that the, of, of how many well owners there are, we've got to let them know and, and not be laissez-faire about that. So, that's my input, and the sooner and the sooner that 
we can make this input, not towards the end of this year, but the sooner we can weigh in, in my mind, the better. And, and that's it. Those are my comments. Tyler has a question or comment. Hey, Andy. Thanks for the insight. Um, I don't want to discount this executive order because I think it's really good. I will echo a little bit what Lynn said. Um, I'm continued to be a little frustrated with the current state of the resources for private well um, water owners. And um, I just think rural Michigan um, isn't getting the resources they need. And I don't want to discount what this order is doing because I think it's great. But I just think there's a fair amount of ignorance and more work to be done to really try to help um, folks that might not know that might presume that their water is safe in rural Michigan. And as Lynn said, there's lots of people out there. So appreciate it. Any other questions? So I guess. Uh, yes. So I Did guess I just have, yeah, I just have a real open question, which is, you know, there, there's several groups. Um, you know, in our watershed in our region that have been meeting to think about, you know, how could a residential private well sampling initiative be funded or, you know, what what the scope of that might look like. Um, and of course, you know, direct state support for something like that is is one option, but, <clears throat> you know, failing, failing that, what I, I'm open to suggestions and discussion about you know, what else we could push for or, you know, and, and, you know, understanding that resources are, are stretched thin and, you know, it's, it's not a, an area where you know, the state has any authority or over private wells. Um, you know, what, what can those of us on the call that can advocate for things, you know, what, what would be good things to advocate for in this space? <clears throat> so just that area where I'm open to suggestions at this point. Okay, um, Joel, you got a uh, comment? Yeah, I like to echo what the last three <laughs> of you already said. That is, as a advisory group here, we recognize the this group of situations where well users are really uh, need some attention. And uh, I guess question to Andy is, is there any, under the current executive order, is there any room to expand it for people who live on the outside of the, you know, Safe Drinking Water Act uh, coverage? Um, and I'll welcome Abby to help me out here. Um, you know, I think th this this executive directive, you know, was it was not entirely, but largely a response to um, you know some significant uh, cases of action level exceedances for lead. Um, which is a um, has grabbed a lot of attention in the state is a significant is a very significant challenge. You know, we have, as you may know, we have two two hundred thousand or some residents in our re households in our state with lead service lines. So this this is a significant issue, and it, you know it has has merits on its own right. I think. Um, if if I were advising this group and sort of sharing my personal opinion, I would not. Um, I think I, I think I wouldn't be looking towards an executive directive or that. Although that could be part of the strategy, you know, I would be looking for some kind of policy solution appropriation to support an effort to um, encourage and make resources available for those 
1.12 million households in our state on private wells. Um, uh, you know, because these these executive directives they don't they don't come with uh, appropriations for the most part. You know, they're not they they're largely you know focused on departments using existing resources to um, respond to direction from the governor. So um, and I'll just say. Um, you know, not a conversation between that I have with a Abby or Amy or Kelly um, occurs without us talking about this very topic of how can we get more people to, how can we support people and how can we convince people um, to get their wells tested. Mm -hmm. So I feel like you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm traveling. I'm channeling Travis from our last meeting and not wanting to sort of blur any bounds of becoming an advocate here in a in a inappropriate way. But I think um, you'd certainly get a lot of support um, from the department. I believe if you wanted to get your shoulder behind that. I think there's also um, one of the things that we've also recognized, though, Andy, is is that an eagle effort wouldn't be complete without the synergy of support from NGOs and from our partners across the the other, uh, you know, not just agencies, but the other citizens, you know, these kinds of grassroots efforts, whether it's the COG or it's the watersheds or it's, you know, whatever nonprofit is out there that's looking, um, all of those, if we could get that synergy working, because this, this can't be just an, an eagle effort. This can't be just a DHHS effort. Um, this has to be a state of Michigan effort for all of our citizens. And so I think there's an opportunity here for a lot of synergy and yeah, I'd, we'd love to spend a lot of time talking about it, so. And Mary had a comment. I do, um, in January, uh, Representative uh, Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin had met with Representative Mueller dealing with our issue here in Holly. And she had stated that there were billions of dollars uh, donated to the state of Michigan, not donated, but allocated um, to deal with clean water. And I'm just wondering where things stand as far as those federal funds and if some of those could possibly be allocated uh with the state of michigan for that testing that we've been discussing thank you yeah i'm gonna you want I'll, to try that one andy i'll try it i'm gonna get out of my depth really quickly and i think we don't have <laughs> i don't have backup here but um so you'll recall uh, a couple months ago uh the state legislature passed the governor signed a supplemental uh, $4 billion supplemental. Um, $1.9 billion of that was set aside for water infrastructure in investments. Those dollars were will, will flow through Eagle in a prescribed fashion and be, um, you know, 99%, something like that. Um, invested in communities around the states for projects they will um, seek grants and loans for um, in rough language. So the, and those funds, that $4 billion, that was a mixture of um, funds from the um, Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act, also called the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, federal funds, some of the the relief funds um, that remain, the COVID relief funds, and, and some general state of Michigan general fund resources. I don't know. Uh, I'm not as in tune on the budget enough to understand if there's another such opportunity coming down the pike, or if that 
that was it. So there, there may be somebody on the call who knows more about it than I do. You know, I think, I don't think we're, um, we're not at the end of the opportunity to use the, I don't believe we're at the end of the opportunity to use the resources, these sort of once in a gener generation infrastructure resources, federal resources, um, shaping the, the investment of those, but I don't really know the details. Um, but it's, it's worth keeping an eye on. And that's what I've heard Andy as well, is, is that the, the money, the, the billions of dollars of money that we're talking about is gonna flow through Eagle. Um, none of it was set aside for funding for staff or um, additional internal resources. It was all gonna go directly to communities, especially communities uh, affected by PFAS to do municipal water hookups. So it will be dedicated, there will be a lot of it dedicated specifically for communities for PFAS work, um, but I haven't heard about any of it that would be set aside for, uh, that might be able to be used for uh, residential drinking water testing. But believe me, um, it is something I'm keeping an eye out for. So if the opportunity, if I hear of the opportunity for something like that, I'm gonna put our, are bid in. Now there is still quite a bit of wranglings going on with the budget and um, in the legislature and so I think they're still having additional meetings this week and there's still a lot of a lot of one-time appropriation stuff on the table that um, I don't think Andy and I get all the details on but we know that that kind of stuff is happening and we'll see what comes out of it. Well it'd be nice to get at least uh you know, somebody to help uh, update the website and send out letters to affected communities. So, yeah, somebody we could figure out to do that. That'd be great. Um, well, any other questions? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that uh, update. And we're going to move on to the uh, uh, the focus group on public notification. So. Uh, Kelly, do you want to put up the uh, email from uh, Aaron? You make that just a tad bigger, or you know, just expand it a little more so we can see the whole. I no, the, I think the text is fine. There, there you go. Yeah. Um. Can you get the whole thing on the screen or? Maybe just scroll up one click. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, we had some, uh, I think, very good discussions uh, in the focus group. And we also had uh, one uh, with, uh, with, with MPART and we were looking for a, a written, uh, confirmation that uh, Eagle agrees in principle with the uh, I, with the idea of uh, notifying the public. And Aaron was uh, kind enough to uh, uh, sit in on those discussions and he also put this uh, memo together, uh, which is the uh, um, agreement in, in uh, about uh, notifying the public uh, in, in principle. And I think there's more work that has to be done in terms of uh, Getting uh, getting it fine, getting fine tuning done, and that's where the engaging the public uh, subcommittee will will come in. But uh, I just wanted to have this uh, put out to the uh, cog members, and this is uh, the uh, confirmation that uh, M that Eagle does agree with uh, the concept of uh, notifying the public uh, when an investigation starts. And obviously, there has to be more. Detail put in about timelines and, and different scenarios with uh, the various situations. I think the matrix that we put together was, uh, you know, a good first cut on that. But this is the uh, response from uh, Eagle. And are there any questions or comments after you had a chance to look at it? So this is up for discussion. Mary. 
Thanks. I, I did participate in the Friday meeting. Um, I, I only have one question and it's regarding the second paragraph, the last sentence. And I, I'm just wondering about the section that it says um, at or above the established health based level. Does that mean that you're looking for that limit of those seven uh, or eight PFAS that are already listed? Or is this a different type of level? I think it really talks to the, the fact that we're going to try to stick with the best available science and not just worry about what the regulatory MCL is, but stick with the science that goes behind it. Um, so as things develop over you know, the coming uh, years that we will continue to look to see, um, just like we've done with, with the homes that had detections, but not above um, a regulatory limit, they still got filters. And so I think we would still look to an extra measure of caution, extra measure of protection, um, and make sure that we're, we're really identifying um, all of the potential people that might be exposed. So I think the health-based, in some cases, the health-based health based, um, levels are a little bit lower. Some cases are same as the MCLs, but if they do change, we would, um, you know, continue to use the best available science. I guess, I guess my other part to that though is, I mean, our, our objective has always been to notify people as soon as possible. And does this imply that you're gonna be waiting for the data to all come back before notifying? Or are we gonna send that general letter to say that you may be exposed and you might want to take precautions. I think that's going to be part of the details that we've been discussing um, how this is going to get played out site by site. Some cases we may need to do it before we have data. In other cases, we may need data to, to really feel out, see if there's really an issue. Um, but I, I, you know, saying it's always going to be one way uh, is something that we did discuss in that meeting and um, we wanted, we need the flexibility to be able to do this on a on a case by case basis to make sure that, um, just to make sure we're being really protective. So, yeah, and I wanted to bring up, uh, you know, two potential examples. Uh, obviously, if there's a uh, a PFAS site and there's wells on the property that, uh, you know, there was it was a suspected site and there was wells that came back and. The wells were uh, above the drinking water standards. Then uh, I think it would be imperative in that case, uh, where you would actually want to go out and notify the public uh, right away. Uh, if you had wells on the site that were hot and uh, there was uh, private drinking water wells in the area, that would be uh, a trigger to go out and notify the public. If you put down uh, a well and you find it's you know half of the drinking water standard on, on the site um you know that's where you might want to collect more information before you notify the public because there's nothing in the first initial samples that would, would trigger a, a notification so uh and then other other cases like we talked about with an airport where they uh applied the foam and there's drinking water wells around there um, you probably don't need samples to notify people. You know, there's probably contamination and you should notify people. So we've got three different uh, spectrums. There's three different uh, scenarios and we do have to craft uh, some kind of a notification protocol to include all of those. So I, I think the uh, the basics are here. It, it does uh, talk about <clears throat> having data, but it says uh, we know or suspect to be exposed. So uh, I, I think it's it's relatively broad. And yes, we do have to, you know, provide more uh, more detail in the future. So I see Charlie's hand is raised and then Dan. Thank you, Rick. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Um, it's, it's great to be able to see this on the screen and I appreciate all involved um, making it visible for the COG and anybody who happens to watch this recording in the future. Um, I certainly have a better understanding now for what's in this message. What I'm what I'm lacking and what perhaps other people are lacking, perhaps not, but certainly somebody who came in cold to this recording or into this meeting uh, might lack is the context. Um, what Friday's meeting was, why Friday's meeting was held, um, et cetera. Um, does, does that make sense? Could you yeah. or another take a minute or two? I don't think any more than that is necessary just to set forth the context for this message of response or a statement of uh, eagle per position or perspective from Aaron Keeley. Thank you. Well, I can provide uh, some of that, but I uh, I wasn't at the last meeting and I think the the last meeting uh, Dan's comment about uh, polluters getting uh, sooner notice than the public uh, struck a chord and I, I think that this uh, subcommittee was formed to try and uh, reach some uh, broader agreement, uh, not necessarily a detailed agreement, but some broader agreement to, to have MPART put in writing that they agreed to the principle of notifying the public when a PFAS investigation starts. So uh, there was a uh, memo from Sandy and, and Sandy, uh, you know, contacted members of the subcommittee and we kind of uh, agreed on that memo. Uh, we don't have a copy of that, but that was uh, sent out. And then uh, this memo uh, or this, uh, yeah, this email from uh, Aaron uh, followed that. So. Uh, you know, it, it's it's just trying to get uh, trying to get a commit a written commitment about uh, the public should be notified when a PFAS investigation starts. So that's uh, what uh, Aaron was responding to, and he was uh, involved with the meeting. And uh, I think uh, I think it was a very good uh, discussion. And this this uh, you know. We probably would like a little more details and we can work those out, but the, this is, uh, you know, the, the, the first step. And I think uh, uh, the, the key is uh, that uh, it's a process and not a pass fail test. So we're looking at uh, moving forward in a process and not trying to say, well, all the details are here. So, you know, it, it failed, it, it's failed. Uh, we were, we're moving forward together, uh, working as a team, and uh, I think this kind of sets the ball in motion that uh, MPART agrees with the, the concept of public notification when PFAS investigations start, and we look forward as a uh, uh, committee to uh, and as a advisory group to uh, putting together more details and fleshing this out uh, more so there's a a uh, more definitive process to uh, notify people under various scenarios. So uh, obviously the scenario that I bring up is the, you know, the Huron River Fishing Advisory. I think that was a very good example of, uh, we didn't need letters to go out to everybody in the watershed, but there was a lot of uh, public service announcements. Uh, MDHHS was, was talking about uh, fishing advisories and um, that message got out to uh, to most people, and in that scenario, you don't need the public notices. But when somebody's well is contaminated, or when somebody has private drinking water wells around a PFAS investigation, that's uh, probably going to find something, or we have data that we get those notifications out to people, so they can make their own decisions to decide whether they want to uh, drink alternate water until they know more, have their own water tested. Um, but it's it's important to empower the people to make an informed decision uh, right when the investigation starts. So. Oh, thanks, Rick. That was super helpful for me. OK, and then uh, Dan has a comment, so we'll turn it over to him. Yeah, and thanks for for everybody's comments. So you know, maybe 
got the wheels turning and made me think of a whole bunch of other things, but I'll I'll restrain myself. But uh, you know, I, I, I you know, during this discussion, um, Andy, Aaron, and Abby, all all in different ways, but all in good ways, kind of you know brought to the forefront the really the idea of the second paragraph, which is that you know the 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 thing that we all agree on is that we want to be protective of public health and we want to treat community members um you know we, we want to be protective of community members and not prioritizing uh, active polluters or responsible parties yeah and that that came through very clearly um you know in regards to you know the, the details of you know how notification would work in different cases and you know relative to the health-based values you know it it I feel pretty good when Abby says, you know, we need to follow the science on this and, you know, be protective of health. You know, that, that's what it's all about. Um, and the science does keep shifting. And just so, you know, there's there's one line of thinking is, you know, as soon as you find PFAS anywhere, should you notify people nearby? Um, and if you start clicking around on the PFAS geographic information system, site and you start clicking on those blue polygons and clicking on the you know the water uh, surface water sample test you, you find out pretty quickly that pretty much anywhere you look you're going to find sort of this background level um you know maybe four parts per trillion five parts per trillion of, of one pfas chemical or another so there, there has to be some you know practical public health threshold for um you know what you're looking for and if and if you're going based on what the science says, then that that seems pretty good to me. Um, and and just, you know, Rick kind of put a, a button in that on on this last comment. Yeah, the, the fish advisory for the Huron River was, I think, handled pretty well, um, really well. And the work that HHS has done with us on the Eat Safe Fish program has been really helpful for getting the word out. Um, so that there are a lot of different strategies to to go after this in in different cases. Um, anyway, so it, it it seems like a nice balance, and yeah, you know, we're all problem solvers, and we want to get into the details and figure out how to get after all of these different things. But this was a good first step, I, I felt. Uh, Caitlin. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm Caitlin, I work with the Michigan League of Conservation Voters, and I just, um, I know that one of the barriers that has been talked about um, when it comes to notifying the public is just uh, amount of manpower. And so I just, I wanted to make sure, I know it's been said before that there are nonprofits that'd be happy to help. Um, the Michigan League of Conservation Voters is one of those organizations that would be happy to help with that process. So just wanted to make sure that was offered. Yeah, no, we appreciate I, that, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Caitlin. I, um, you know, that that kind of uh, synergy with our, our nonprofits is definitely in the back of my mind as to how we might leverage that, um, because we've got a very strong, a strong environmental uh, groups across the state that do a lot of really good work. So um, don't think that I'm going to leave you out of my grand schemes for for somehow making sure that everybody gets tested and that you know, everybody is aware of PFAS and aware of the potential for their drinking water, um, you know, not necessarily to be impacted, but just to make sure they understand the potential of PFAS already in, in so many different things. Um, drinking water obviously is our biggest concern, but um, we'll definitely include you guys. Thanks for that. Any other comments hey. from the COG? Yeah, Rick, this is Connie. I yep. can't see uh, the response that Aaron uh, prepared, but listening to what you stated is in that response. You talk about public notification when investigation takes place. That could not, that could be troublesome. Maybe community notification should take place at the same time as the PRP is notified by EGLE. If you wait until a PFAS investigation takes place, that could be a year or two later 
before the PRP uh, decides to do it because he'll be meeting with his attorneys, his environmental attorneys, figuring out how can that particular PRP minimize costs. So I think we need to make a distinction, an important distinction. Community notification takes place at the same time as the PRP is notified by Eagle, not when an investigation takes place. That could be too late. Those are my thoughts. Well, I think we're kind of talking about the same thing because uh, like uh, in, in the case with, with the airports and the phone, um, once uh, MPART identifies, you know, an airport and they use foam, uh, you know, they're, they're going to request a PFAS investigation and that that would, we we're looking for notification at the same time. So uh, I think, I, I guess I, I don't want to have a situation where, you know, an industry uh, or a polluter, you know, drags their feet on the investigation and, and that, that does not go public. I think we need to, you know, figure out a way around that. But, uh, you know, I, I think in for the, the investigations as far as MPART, uh, and I, I could be wrong, maybe Abby wants to, to, to say something, but, um, you know, as, as soon as information is available about PFAS being at a particular site, um, that that implies that there's already been an investigation or there's information like like we heard at the uh, you know, when we did the uh, the um, case study for Nuevo County, there was uh, a baseline environmental assessment that was done and that data was transmitted to Eagle. So, uh, you know, we were looking for notification of the public when when that data was obtained by Eagle. So, um, you know, I, I think we have to kind of consider starting an investigation, um, maybe the information to start an investigation is available. Because um, I, I think if we wait till the investigation, you know, there, there could be litigation about taking wells and things like that. So we may want to be a little proactive in terms of, uh, you know, when information is available uh, about a contamination site, then uh, the public is notified. So that, that's a, it's a good point. And I think Connie, okay. we we talked exactly about that in the meeting on Friday. Um, Daniel brought that point up uh, very succinctly and and stated that issue as as one of uh, the major concerns. And so um, I believe that uh, Kelly was going to forward that email from Aaron Keatley to the whole group, so you guys can all see it and read it. Um, but that is the intention in there. Now to Rick's point. Uh, we will have to have a lot of ongoing conversations that will talk about specific situations and, and scenarios for um, what constitutes an investigation, what point people be no notified. But we will, you know, I think the commitment is we will have those conversations and we'll start working towards um, a progression of improvement over time. Because that's that's what you know. We're, we want to prioritize those that are most at risk first. We want to prioritize those with drinking water wells first. Um, but there is a lot of uh, a lot of details and finesse that goes into what's an investigation, what really constitutes an investigation, what's an investigation that might actually impact people. Um, so we got lots of lots of discussion time to chew on those questions. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mary has her hand up. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, say that when Kelly was sending the Aaron Keatley letter, could she possibly send the uh, same email that Sandy sent uh, today? That might give other people a um, better idea as Rick was explaining the point of the meeting. Thank you. Yeah. No, those should be sent together. I, th I think that's a good idea because it, um, Sandy kind of summarizes, uh, you know, the, the COGS point of view and then, uh, yeah, I think that's good to send both together. Um, we've got a, a large number of uh, COG members that have not said anything. Uh, 
you know, if, if you want to say something, feel free to offer your opinion on this. This is pretty important, and you know, I think we're moving forward in a good direction. And if uh, any COG members have uh, thoughts, comments, or uh, want to help uh, guide the direction that we move in, uh, please do. Joe. I uh, appreciate what you guys have done, and uh, I think uh, we got to move forward with uh, you know everybody's uh, help. But I got one question to to uh, Abby. The way you are set up, uh, this is a very simple question: Do you need more staff and more money to do all these things? in a timely matter? Oh, oh, Joe, if you have a million dollars in your back pocket, yes, yes. Um, hey, yes I got more than a million. <laughs> OK. OK, OK, well, come talk to me. Um, yes, we can always use more help and more staff. Um, and, and, and that's not to say, I, I don't want to be exclusive that PFAS is the end all be all of contamination. We have a lot of important problems um, in the state. Uh, you know, as Andy's talking about lead service lines, we've got vapor intrusion issues, we've got landfills, we've got a lot of, um, you know, holes in, in our uh, regulatory oversight that could be patched and, and done a better job. Um, but we are trying to, you know, obviously use the available resources the best way possible. So, yes, there's always opportunities for um, more money and for more, um, you know, e even just the little things like we've got really have about four or five people that do grants and loans for the water infrastructure thing. And they've got to somehow process, you know, a billion dollars worth of grants and loans in the next couple of years. Um, that's a mountain of work. That's a mountain of work. So, lots right. of lots of work to be done. But we're. Um, so that's why I'm saying, in order to do some uh, in such an important thing we're talking about, for say uh, residential wells, we're talking, you know, yes, a million population or something like that. And then at the same time, we hear about a billion dollar, you know, coming through. So I think this effort is, is, is worth the uh, really uh, extra support. So where should we go to get that, you know, millions of dollars to get you going better? Well, I think it would be, first of all, it should be a get us going better because this isn't just an M part uh, objective. This is a, we, the people of the state of Michigan objective, you know, with all of our partners, with all of our, you know, NGOs and municipal partners and state level, federal level, we, the people need to make it a priority that drinking water is safe. And so um, I think that, you know, the first step is, is taking an assessment of what we've got, what the situation is, and then pulling together our partners and forming a work group on this very issue. We've got some ongoing object of uh, initiations going with the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm going to try to lob on to a um, campaign they've got for drinking water. Um, but again, that's a small piece. And I really think we need to um, leverage the, the talent and resources that we've already got going in the state to push this issue forward. So before we just throw more money at it, let's take a better look at the resources we've already got and then see how we can leverage those to really do, um, to obtain the, the objectives that we want to get done. Because three, even if we did, even if we did 10% of the state at $300 a test, you know, we got 1.12 million drinking water users. Somebody do the math for me. 10% of that, you know, that's about $30 million. Um, that's a lot of money to do testing. So how do we get the testing done as well as the campaign, as well as reaching out? Um, there's a lot of work to do there. But but over, you know, maybe next 10 years, maybe we can get that done. Um, prioritizing those areas that are, you know, most at risk. So, um, you, Abby, you got Abby, John. 
So, so we go to governors, go go to the legislature. Where should we go? I guess. Andy, you want to jump in? What's your suggestions? Yeah, this is where we always get into sort of dicey spot. Um, but I mean, you know, go back to school. What is it? Schoolhouse Rock, and um, you know, follow the path through the process, which you know, bills and laws are made, and budgets are um, put together and um, signed. I know that's a side swiping answer, but um, but I, I again going back to what we talked about earlier, I think um, I think uh, a concerted effort to get resources behind that private well testing is is something that um, a lot of people from a lot of walks of life and a lot in a lot of positions can could uh, easily see the logic and value in if if um, they were introduced to that idea. Mm-hmm. Good comments. Um, Charlie, do you, do you have your hand up? Yeah, thanks, Rick. Um, I want to circle back to what Connie said, and uh, I wanted to uh, heartily second um, her identification of the need to, um, I don't know, inform members of the public or communities at the same time industry is informed. We're focused on drinking water right now, but uh, in the larger picture are things like surface water, you know, places like uh, Skoda, uh, Traverse City, and, you know, a lot of these uh, sites, my impression, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, in Michigan anyways, uh, industry, federal agencies in the case of Oscoda, have control over the valve of uh, when information is released uh, from their studies. And they often have control over what information is acquired as part of their studies. I'm here in Traverse City. Uh, it's been about a year since <clears throat> Um, studies done by the Coast Guard and, and uh, Cherry Capital Airport were publicly released as part of a town hall, I recollect. And I've heard nothing in the interim. Maybe things are happening, maybe they're not. But um, I just feel that uh, Connie's point that, um, that the timing between notification of industry and notification of of parties that are potentially impacted really needs to be <clears throat> uh, pretty closely coupled. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. I fully agree with what you said. Um, what? Okay, that's it for me. <laughs> all right, Dan, you have a question or comment? Is it? <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of the the comments that we're hearing right now, you know, they're they're good points, and yeah, you know, I, I think Connie raised or raised the the point that words matter, and we should be very careful about the phrasing that we're using. But, you know, I, I think on the call on on Friday, we were all operating under that assumption that you know the investigation essentially begins when. You know the the polluter is is notified, so therefore the community members would be notified at the same time, so that there's no head start. Uh, yeah, I think that that was kind of the, the assumption we were operating under. Um, but it a theme that I'm sort of hearing in in each of the comments is that um, you know, we're we're operating under these assumptions that you know th things are working well, and we know that of course active polluters often are you know are, are not following the rules and are you know actively trying to subvert the rules and delay and etc so um you know we, we all have to keep that in mind unfortunately that it's you know where, where are the loopholes or the gaps um that could be exploited and and 
what I think a number of people have brought up in different ways are, you know, th there are all these things that we keep bumping against to, into and these discussions around one issue or another are really good for highlighting just where are the policy solutions and needs. Um, so if that's, you know, we need to go to the legislator to get more funding for notification or drinking water, you know, private drinking water well testing, then that's, you know, that's something that's, I think, outside the scope of these meetings, but it's something that many of us can can start working on and thinking about. So it's it's helpful to identify you know, where the gaps and the next needs are. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, uh, this is Connie. Just to follow up on Dan's quick on Dan's comment, I'm wondering since for PRPs that have introduce PFAS into drinking water or surface water bodies. Why is it up to Eagle or MPART to do the public notification? How about putting that burden on the PRP? They cost it. Why don't they fund Eagle for the for the notification or MPART for the notification? Because what what you're all saying, oh billions of dollars or millions of dollars, that's taxpayer money. Why should taxpayer be subsidizing private industry whose whole game plan is maximize the profit? How about them paying since they caused the problem? Let them fund MPART to do the public notification if they're responsible for the PFAS source. That's it. No, that, that's, a, that's a good comment. Uh, I think we should also be aware of, though, that uh, a lot of the sites are municipal wastewater lagoons and, you know, air pu public airports and, um, you know, I I would hazard to guess that, you know, it probably, you know, 60 percent of the sites are are, are non-industrial, maybe a, a greater percentage that, you know, cannot be traced back to, a, um, you know, a, a private industry. So. Uh, you know, there, there's, I, I, I do think, you know, the, like for, uh, for, for, for the uh, Wolverine community advisor for the Belmont situation, I, I think <laughs> you know, Wolverine should, you know, the, the, the PRP should be involved with, with, with funding the, the, you know, even funding our, our, our public advisory group, giving us some help to, you know, to conduct our business, but uh you know, mo I think most of the sites, though, will, will not have a deep pocket to go to. So, um, I did want to make one uh, one other comment. Then we'll, we'll Dan's got his hand up again. But um, you know, the, the whole idea of trying to figure out how to uh, conduct a uh, a sampling of uh, public wells uh, or private wells uh, that's that's a big task. But uh, we we have. Uh, you know, some real horsepower in the state. We've got a large USGS office and we have, you know, very good uh, geology, uh, water resources programs at Michigan State and, and Western. And maybe the, the, the governor should set up an advisory panel to, you know, start discussing how to do this. How do we, you know, get our arms around something uh, this large uh, with, you know, some of the key uh, science and uh, technology uh, groups in the state. So um, that's just my thought. I think, uh, you know, we've had advisory groups on a whole host of issues, and I, I think we may want to have an advisory group formed about uh, how to sample and how to prioritize. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, we have big aquifers like the uh, Marshall Formation that you don't necessarily have to service everybody. I mean, they're deep wells, but then we have you know, shallow wells, which should probably be, you know, prioritized. But anyway, I, I think, you know, some kind of a uh, advisory group uh, formed at the uh, the state level uh, would, would be a good first approach to, to try and get our arms around the, uh, the challenges of, of sampling uh, all the wells in the state. Um, anyway, Charlie, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, can you hear me there? Yeah. Yeah, Rick, I'd like to second that and suggest that, um, you know, rather than 
So this really uh, kind of mirrors and adds to what you just said. Rather than aiming for 30 million or whatever the number is to do to do all, I think there would be real value in doing a sampling survey. You know, a well-conceived uh, developing a well-conceived sample of of wells, um, just to get an idea of of the nature of the problem. Um, and it, it would allow whoever is in charge of this, whoever does this, to go forth with, you know, an initial small, relatively small dollar amount. And then uh, once the data are in, once the results are in, you know, then if, if needed, the uh, ante could be upped and uh, a greater number of residential wells could be investigated as warranted. Thank you. You got it. Any other comments on this, uh, um, the notification issue? I think we've had some really good discussions and I, I look forward to uh, more discussions. I, th I thought, again, thought our meeting Friday was really good and hopefully all the <laughs> subsequent meetings will follow that. So um, hearing no other uh, comments, we can move on to uh, the round table. Anybody wants to share something or comments? Um, one thing that uh, I know uh, we talked about, Kelly, was uh, maybe an update. I know you showed the slide about the, the map, but uh, just a comment about uh, you know how many people are using the GIS portal, because uh, I think that's something that came out of this group, and uh, I'm really pleased to see the number of people that are, are using it. If you want to just maybe share that with with the group. We'll definitely get there, Rick, okay. um, but okay. I want to be respectful of Sandy. So when Sandy sent the agenda out, um, she was adamant that this was a priority of the meeting. Okay. Um, so if we can focus here first and then we can. I do. Have those good. I don't see any other uh, comments. Mary has her hand up. OK, Mary and then Daniel or Dan. I guess I'm wondering the first meeting that I ever went to was back in February of 2021. And the person who was speaking was a woman named, I believe, Laureen from a state out uh, on the East Coast, and she was very um, spoke highly of the fact that our agencies could use the resources of citizens that are involved in these issues, because a lot of times the citizens have more time and energy invested in some of the actual details of their own area. And I, I have to say that um, I, I don't know that that message is getting out. Um, and I just wonder for those people in this audience who belong to a community citizen advisory group in their area, how many feel that those groups are being listened to and um, have you noticed any change in how that's come about in the last uh, years? Thank you. Do we have any uh, comments on that? I mean, I can uh, comment about our uh, community advisory group for, for Wolverine and uh, you know, we we do meet once a month and we have, uh, you know, quite detailed agendas and we, we've got a very good line of communication going between our community group and uh, the state. Um, so. Any other community advisory groups uh, want to say something or 
I don't know if we have any. Um, let's see. I thought um, Patty Baldwin's not on the line, but um, no, that, that's that's uh, a, a good thing to to circle back around and uh, maybe just survey the uh, the members of the of the cog. Dan, did you want to say something or? You're on mute, Dan. <laughs> I was just chattering right away. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah, I had, had a, a couple of quick updates, but uh, Mary's question was a good one. With our situation was a little different in that when we first got word yeah that pfas was hitting our watershed uh, we really worked hard to sort of convene um you know all the players in in really two spots in ann arbor and up in milford uh, and that helped get the word out pretty quickly and and from that yeah there were several other smaller groups that you know kind of took notice and and took the reins and i, I so and and we were very intentional to to seek out sort of that legacy information of people that were you know might not otherwise be listened to um so, so in those ways i think they, they are being listened to um there, there are definitely some equity issues that i think are you know not terribly surprising but are are still you know a little disappointing so there's a group out of ann arbor that's looking at the dioxane plume called card um uh and they are very active very well organized very well informed and and really have driven a lot of the discussion around that um site and and that issue uh, but if you look to other parts of the watershed that are more rural or rural or less affluent then you know there are other groups that have tried similar things and haven't been able to to get traction um so that that's something HRWC is sort of conscious of is just how do you get more equitable representation of, of voices in particularly urban and rural areas uh, specifically. Um, so yeah, that was a good question that that Mary raised. Uh, so some successes and failures from us. I, on that note of just you know getting the word out and listening to to you know voices that have that legacy information you know we're working with um anglers through the ecology center fish sampling project and it, it's been really interesting to listen to expert fisher people just on on what they've seen and you know how it's changed their interaction with the water so that's that's been really helpful and, and refreshing to me um, to get to get those voices incorporated uh, and then the other updates I have, uh, so we're starting up another round with River Walkers, working with HHS. Uh, I love this program and and happy to share info with others uh, about how we're we're doing that. And um, it, it was really effective last year, so looking forward to another year on that. And then something I shared on Friday, um, so it was at River Rally, uh, which is the National Conference of River Organizations and PFAS was a major theme throughout that conference and it it's just still really clear to me that a lot of other states a lot of other groups around the country are are looking at what we're doing in Michigan for guidance and ideas of how to move their own states forward so just encouraging everybody to keep up the good work and keep pushing Any other COG members want to uh, provide any updates? Okay. All right, Mary's got her hand up. Sorry, I don't wanna monopolize this, but Rick, you had mentioned something about a survey. Would you like me to include a question or anything when I send the um, 
voting document again to members? Um, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, we can ask ask for uh, for updates and uh, you know just general uh, thoughts on uh, you know there's a lot of people that aren't. Um, Participating, and I, I'm just curious what uh, what other members of the COG are thinking. So, okay, but what, what we can do, do better, that. and you know where uh, where resources should be uh, spent, and uh, you know there's a broad uh, representation uh, from from different counties, and uh, if there's any uh, um, you know. Things that the, the the cog should be focused on or, or should be bringing up. So yeah, that's a good question to add. So if we're going to do multiple questions, um, maybe members who have concerns or things that they would like to pull the cog on, maybe you could send those questions to me over the next few days, and then yeah. I can send that document. Yeah, it sounds really good. Thank you. So uh, yeah, just uh, send Mary your thoughts. So. Oh, we've got about 10 minutes left, so. Hey, Rick, this is Connie. I have a quick question for you. Is it on one of our upcoming meetings, if could we have maybe 15 minutes from the group, it was a university group, and I can't remember the name of the university, that was studying the wildlife in Clark's Marsh, what the PFAS concentrations were. And yeah, when, we, when I raised that question, I guess about six months ago, they weren't done yet, but I would sure like to hear an update on that. Connie, they you know which one I yeah, they're going to be giving a short update to um, the Ascoda group um, on next week, Wednesday, I believe. But um, oh, we can make some arrangements okay. to get them to come, get them to come and do a, a update to this group. You know, July or August or something you know, a little bit later. I know that they're they've just got. I think they're only going to do like ten minutes at the Wednesday meeting, but I think they will be doing a more full update um later in the summer so i think they just got oh, their first draft okay. of the of the report done so they're getting there oh good mm -hmm. okay great thanks okay kelly has some uh google analytics to share so yeah so rick asked me um to pull some google analytics together and like i said earlier we kind of use this to also help gauge what pages we're going to put priority in updating on our website. Obviously, they're all a priority to update, but we have a ton of different information out there. So this tells us how many total visitors we had um, in approximately a month tells us how much time they've spent on our website. So it looks like people are going to our website, looking for a specific thing and then leaving. So obviously we wanna capture their attention for longer than just a minute, but some of the top uh, pages that they're visiting are obviously our home page, our sites and area of interest, the firefighting phone page right now. I've, um, all the firefighters in the state of Michigan are doing training right now where they're given this specific page for additional information. So that's not shocking to see PFAS sampling guidance and then our general investigation page. Um, also, we can tell the top five uh, documents that are low or that are downloaded from our website. Right now, it's the minimum analyte list with 22 downloads. Um, interestingly enough, uh, March 
2019 Wurtsmith Air Force Base boundary map is also one of the top documents downloaded. Um, I say interestingly enough because it's from 2019. Uh, general PFAS sampling guidance, surface water sampling guidance, um, and the Eat Safe Fish press release. So this tells us how people are accessing our website. Most people are accessing still through desktop. Uh, like we said earlier, we're at just over 50% new visitors. So that's good to see uh, coming from all across the state, all across the nation. Uh, so that's exciting to see, kind of aligns with what Dan Brown had heard that, you know, other, states are looking to Michigan for information. And the top URL that is clicked is in fact our GIS map that I showed earlier. So um, our data layers are continuing to get looked at. They're useful. And, you know, we continue to have conversations about what kind of layers um, we can add here. One of the concerns with this particular GIS map uh, that Dan Brown raised was load time. You know, the more layers that you add, the longer it's going to take to load, the more users you're going to lose during that time. We can also pull analytics on how long it takes uh, for pages to load. And right now we're at 2.7 seconds. Um, they actually say that anything over 2.5, you start to lose users. Um, but given the traffic that we're seeing, you know, I, I think we're still doing a good job. So hopefully we can stay right around there um, with the additional layers that we're going to add. So. Um, we can also pull Google, Google Analytics, like I said, on site investigation pages. Uh, obviously, Wolverine, Wurtsmith are top pages that continue to be viewed. They continue to be updated. Um, some of the ones in, in Southeast Michigan, unfortunately, one user is looking at them. <laughs> Connie Boris. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Connie. You know, we're trying to get all the pages updated as we can. We're working with over 80 some site leads. Again, we're not their boss. They have other priorities in their job. If we see that there's urgency to get those pages updated, please know we're going after those people to get them updated. And we're still working with the broken, if there's any uh, final broken links that um, from the Eagle web page migration, we're still working on those as well. Yes, and, and the web team that we have access to is also the same web team that works on the Eagle site, which you can imagine how big that web platform is. And they both went live at the same time. They both have their own issues. So it's kind of a collective effort that they're working to get everything fixed, but it's going to take some time because yeah. they're also getting new stuff to post at the same time. Kelly, we've just got the one slide left with the new sites that I was hoping to mention real quick. Um, we are up to 219 sites now, 219 or 220, Kelly, are we at 219? So these are the new, um, these are sites that just went live uh, in the last month. Middleville Wastewater Treatment Plant, North Kent Landfill, um, which we just, it's not a new site, but we just separated it from the rest of the Wolverine stuff. So it finally got its own web page piece. Um, the Ford Airport Iron Mountain, uh, Brandon School District Wastewater Treatment Plant, the uh, 360 South Street Car Wash, um, the General Motors Customer Care and After Sales Facility in Waterford, 
and then the 850 Lad Road, Walled Lake. So um, like Rick said, a lot of those are municipality owned or um, they're not your typical, they're not typically what we think about as libel parties. Uh, so really just one of them, you know, GM is the biggest as far as industry. The rest are are more of your smaller, smaller sites. So um, go ahead, Dave. Uh, Abby, I have one quick question. Are all these sites, these sites that you have listed here, when you list these each month, those sites have been tested by either MPART or EGLE and P, sources of PFOS have been found on these particular sites? Yeah, to become an MPART site, we've got at least one monitoring well in the groundwater that's above uh, uh, criteria. And okay. so, um, and we know that there are there's some sort of a source. There, there. In some cases, some of these are not high strength source. Right. Um, I think the Brandon School District's got like one or two wells that are just right there. Um, so they're not hot necessarily all high strength sources, but they are sources. And okay. I think that's going to be one of the things we're going to find going forward is is that there's a lot of sources um, around our state. When it comes to PFAS, I think we all have sources in our homes. We all have sources probably in our own yards. And so it's going to be it's going to be a tough, a tough discussion about who's a source. And um, but we're right now we're sticking with the definition of it has to be a source and it has to be have a criteria or an exceedance of uh, groundwater cleanup criteria to become us and part site. But okay, thank you. to add clarification okay. to that, Dave. Um, those aren't necessarily samples that Eagle or MPART collected. It's true. data that we have. It's true. Yeah. Who, what, what was that last statement, Kelly? It's data that we have. So, for example, General Motors, Customer Care, you asked if Eagle or MPART collected those samples. We did not collect those samples. Okay, where where did the samples come from? So General Motors collected that sample. Okay. Part of their ongoing, um, you know, regulatory uh, investigation and or monitoring, long-term monitoring that they might be doing. So a lot of these are, um, you know, North Kent Landfill's been a site for a long time as as this General Motors. And so these are just ongoing monitoring efforts that PFAS got rolled into their monitoring and now they're, they've are they found some PFAS uh, concentrations. Uh, I see Mary's had her hand up for a while. Do you wanna, do you have a comment or question? I just have one thing as far as a upcoming um, topic for the agenda. Um, if we could get an update on progress to having more PFAS compounds limits set, or find out what the process, what, what the progress is right now on those. Thank you. Uh, so, is that a question you want answered right now, then, Mary? No, no. For a future, for a future, future agenda. Okay. Yeah, we may want to have uh, NDHHS uh, talk about uh, any new MCLs. That, do they do the, the the toxicology? Do they do the recommendations or Abby? Or? Uh, last time we did, we used outside. Um, right. We had okay. some outside uh, yeah. advisors, toxicologists, uh, some of the same ones that are advising EPA right now. So. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's a great topic for, for an upcoming okay. meeting. All right, um, Tyler's next. Yeah, thank you. Um, question, I'm curious if MPART and or EGLE um, in upcoming COG meetings could share um, success metrics. What does success look like? I don't know if either organization sets annual goals, but I think it would be super helpful like the Google Analytics for the COG to uh, see what success looks like for the organization and how are we doing on a monthly cadence to those goals. It might be increased testing or decreasing the time to notify the public, but any sort of those 
specific data measurements we could see, I think would be helpful, um, especially in this environment where we have constrained resources. Great question, Tyler. Yeah. I tell you, one of the metrics that you guys have set for us is trying to get the information out there as fast as we possibly can. All right, Dave's got a question. No, I'm, I'm, I just didn't lower my hand. Sorry. Oh, OK. Um, why don't you go to your last slide? Because there's uh, something on there that I wanted to. The one about uh, the upcoming the call for abstracts. Yeah, there's a PFAS summit coming up. Do you want to just say a little bit about that? Yeah, the call for abstracts went out for the um, December's Great Lakes PFAS Summit uh, that we've done annually now. This will be the third or fourth year, um, and so we're gonna we're gonna shrink it down to two and a half days. But it's in December. Um, we've got a call for abstracts out. They're all due by July first. So if we've got anyone who wants to submit an abstract from this group, please do um, go ahead and get it to us, submit it through that um, abstract form. If you need it, we can go ahead and provide it again. So uh, tell your um, colleagues that might be in research or your colleagues who might be studying PFAS um, or have got a really good story to tell. Uh, this, I'm trying to remember the, the uh, Topics, but but just about anything is is open for abstracts. So uh, it's a great summit, and we've you know last year we had over 1,600 participants. So that's huge. That's huge. Um, there is, and I don't know if it's gone out yet. I don't know if we got anybody from DHHS on. We usually do a spring update for foam press release, just reminding people to. Um, use caution, wash your hands, avoid the foams that you're going to see uh, potentially around our lakes. I'm going to table the three legged stool approach and hope that we can talk about that next time, Rick, because we don't have time this time, yeah, as well good. as um, some of these other things, because I think we talked a little bit about the budget. Um, I'm talking with local health departments about PFAS training. Um, because they are, you know, they've had tremendous turnover and they also need and would like some additional uh, training on PFAS basics as well as process. So we'll be um, talking with them and putting together a training program that um, probably will kick off in the fall, but looking to um, get that going. And then we're uh, slogging through the airport grant proposals um, to get, you know, another chunk of money out to our airports to make sure that they're supported in doing good conceptual site models and characterization of their uh, cleanups at the airports. So I think in a very short time, because we're already over, uh, that's all we got for now. The rest of it, I think okay. we should take till next time. Sounds real good. Um... I wanted to thank everybody for a, a very productive meeting. And uh, there's no other questions or comments. Uh, everybody can have a nice, uh, a nice uh, warm uh, evening tonight. So, <laughs> yes. All right. Enjoy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.